I think it's the first time I've been on the phone with the chair. I was more nervous than the But I uh, remember that I was in Korea and the mayor of this area, the mayor of Bombay, the mayor of the area, and she was a land of yours, so I think she was a country owner. So she was a little bit of rivalry in her Bombay. I don't know, she didn't know she had a girl, she had a scammer, but. ฉันก็เลยเป็นคนมาแล้วก็ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที่ที
and that was a reflection of it. Before that, you would have been 10, 12 years. Now it was, you know, she went for a long haul. But in the Cromer Road, in 1976, which was a beautiful summer, I mean, that idea of that was, was, was far away from our, our heads. It was a new policy has been brought in, I'm not totally aware of what it's going to mean. We hear the <coughs> blocks have been built, but then here one is sinking. I think it might have been through each three or something because it's very marshy ground. So this, I think, reinforced in our minds this is a totally silly policy. And the Brits will wake up in six months, we'll have the status and we'll be back up in the cages and, 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 and life will be as it, as it was before. It's almost literally living in a vacuum and, and you know, when you think of what did evolve later on, at that time, what, that wasn't our thinking. We didn't know about I'm not even sure the term communication policy was there, other than this very fake thing that they've taken away our clothes. But what, what had to happen was some policy, well, what's going to happen here whenever the first person is the sentenced? And I remember Kieran Nugent been there, and probably was the best person to be the first person sentenced because he was called Heather, which may give you some idea of what he was like. He was squat, false old guy, ginger hair, and had a sort of a down dirty guess here, so he was the best person to be the first one to come the box. But other than that, in terms of um, you know, really what was the gains from outside, or what was the, the staff in the jail thinking and all the rest of it, nobody had any idea at all of how we were going to handle this, this, this protest. Outside, it was coming out probably the channels of what had been a lengthy uh, ceasefire, intelligence that had been gathered during that time and, and, and such like. Um, a leadership <coughs> believing that the Brits were actually withdrawn and what was happening was an economic recession, which would again probably just didn't have an understanding of economics or whatever. And again, that's not a criticism, just saying that's the reality of where we were at that particular time. And there's no point in thinking back and thinking, well, it should have been different, we should have this, we should have that. We just didn't. Even people who had been uh, in the cages and who probably had a wee bit of savvy had no more knowledge of where things were going to go than, than the rest of us. And I can remember the talks in there was. Bonnie McReynolds was the, was the OC who had been interned himself. And it was basically, we're not going to wear this, this prison uniform. Okay, and Kieran, we knew he was going to be the force, and so, anybody any questions? No, he said, we're not wearing the uniform. That was about the much discussion went until the policy, which became a five year event after that. Kieran got sentenced, he was going to know what happened after, he started to work back about brutality and, and, and such like. Um, but there's still this. Uh, Cavalier, jovial attitude about it, and I'm sure even of like this isn't going to last long. And actually, you wanted to get sentenced to get up there and get in the middle of it because you obviously then you're on the point of protest and we would want to cut the status and it was now all over. And that was a type of thinking widespread throughout. And from my experience only in seeing in the Common Road Jail, there was no one sitting down saying, "No, this is this is uh, this is something big. Here. This is this is a long drawn out policy. This is." You know, kids and shoes either that later. Um, this is central sort of part of the whole plank of, of what Britain's trying to do. And the young guys in jail still think about it, say, and the dancers and the one about and all the rest of it and, and what was happening. Um, as we know, things things did change. I got sentenced in uh, 77, a life in Britain. I mean, they were given a life in Britain, like Dolly Mixter, 77, 78, 79, with the largest numbers of, of, of life sentences given out. Because the idea was they were just going to put these people off the street and for a long enough period to get outside, sort of out. Um, because I think it's right, as Tommy said, we want to focus on the prisoners, but in many senses, to get people off the streets in the first place, people who they now have intelligence on, to get rid of, and then try in the meantime to encourage things like the peace people and all the rest of it, to try to end the whole struggle on the outside. The time I got sent, there was 100, um, I got literally 100, I ended up having to go to H2 for about six days before I got moved up to H5. Uh, uh, in, in the cell of Budgie or next door, I don't know if the Jack and Mimone ended up in the office street. Um, and still, even by that time, there was, um, you know, they nearly created a bit of a, a life in the jail, the blanket, you could go out and brush out your cell and all the rest of it. So, it's nearly still you're creating your own, you're probably going to do your own, your own structures there. It was ironic that around that time there was some senior prison officer spoke out more or less in favour of political status. Um, I think he was surprised that the, the protest had, had gone on this length of time and all the rest of it. And then it's did what happened there, everyone shot him and that was, that was the end of that and he was lost. I many prison officers ever spoke out in, in, in sort of support of returning political status. But it was only then as time started to move on, the end of 78, um, and the numbers were increasing. We were now doubled up in cells and cells were never meant to be for, for one. Um, there was our block starting, H3 was, was up in the room, and ended up in H4 for about H6. Um, the administration was out there to, to, to break that there down. 
and also say I think we're starting to think of, of, of upper delicate memory and the calm from the word Sean, uh, Sean McKenna, who was on the first Humber Street with Tommy, was overseeing each five and sending over a, a calm himself and Shana Walsh. Uh, we were doing OCA and Agent at the wing, and it was about with options of sitting as we were doing nothing or we could, we could start to try to push things a bit. And it was also the challenge of brutality that was going on at that, that time, and, and the screws become much more about get out of the toilet. All the, all the things have been written about. So it was us starting to say, well, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's sort of do something to, to, to rather than just be passive, uh, let, let, let's do something to change it. Again, there's no thought out policy, let's go on and watch protests. And it just shows, and I think it's always interesting about how things happen at the time rather than sitting 20 years later or 30 years later looking back on them and saying, oh yes, that led to that and that led to that and such like. It did in some sense, but often very accidentally. Um, Tom McFeely was taken to the boards along with Sean Campbell under a, a special rule. It was section 40 where they could just take you, didn't have to have a charge, it was excellent because uh, Tom McFeely was okay at that time. Really. And uh, they went on a homeward first strike. And for the first time, really, in some sense, it had the headlines about the Higgs box. And um, that, I think, scared the present authorities, but Tom and Sean were brought back again. Um, I think the, the, the Scrooge thought that was going to end the protest. The protest at that time was stopping, brushing out, refusing to brush out. Then we're refusing to wash in ourselves. We wanted to the shower and all the rest of it. And um, the administration responded in a very feminine way, whenever they seen it. They thought they brought back Tom and Sean, and that would not have been ended, they didn't. The thought they didn't want to be dead. What was the next step of the campaign? But again, it was all very, very good stuff. They responded very violently in the wing I was in. Uh, Kevin Campbell from, from Derry and Drew Forbes were carried out, like, literally dragged out unconscious from the wing, and the screws came to remove the furniture. Now, there was no reason why they were coming to do this. They just decided, okay, we're going to get the bit of legions, I think they're going to mess about them, and they're going to brush their cells and, and whatever. And within a matter of days, we're going to watch protests. For a whole reason of things, they did one thing, we did the other. They, they come around with disinfectants, so we break the windows, they come in again. <coughs> And before you know it, we were on a wise protest, which we ended up in for three years. And it wasn't thought out, and this was, for me it's like many other things that happened during the, the, the whole struggle, particularly at, at that period. Not thought out in terms of long term, what's, if we do this, this is going to do this, what's the repercussions, if you have several people debating, well, maybe we should try that or free that. Just didn't happen, it didn't happen for a lot of times. Throughout the whole struggle, it was, use your wits at the time, whatever is best. But the problem is, once you get into it, like getting into an armed struggle, then it's much more difficult to get out of it. You're in it, and that now becomes a principle. And I remember whenever we were ending the No Watch protest, the day after Bobby Sands was starting up a strike, I was at the door family opposed to ending the No Watch protest. Because the days were like a weakness, we're going to end. Bobby starts a hunger strike one day, the next day we're going to start watching them. It's just going to show like we're weak. Which was just madness. It was the best decision that was ever made, was to end the No Watch protest. Bobby starting a hunger strike was a way out of it, um, because it had. Served as purpose at this time, which is now of, of, of no avail. And it's just, again, if I give a, a flavour of how things happen and you're in it and your mindset gets stuck into it, and actually later on, you look back on it, this movie maybe slightly different. Having said all of that, I think that every decision we made was the best we probably could have made in those times and those circumstances. I'm not going to go through all the, all, all the, all the things again about what led up to the first hunger strike. I think it was that hunger strike was often talked about simply because the history in Ireland of hunger strikes. Numerous examples of people, people who are for political status or repatriation or, or, or whatever else. Uh, so there's at least a the knowledge there that it's not something you rush into. And I think by that stage, um, and I remember being in uh, Big Six with, with Richard, Bobby Sands, and Rick McFarlane, the Dark, all the rest of it, and, and, and uh, in 79, when again the, the screws, they tried various activities throughout the whole period to try to break it. One was isolation, taking people up to age six, or it was just forced washing, which is just sheer brutality on a, on a, on a gross level. Um, all those things, but it was 79 really before, in my head only, but I think in terms of most sort of prisoners, that there was a clear view of what criminalization was about and how important this was in the whole plank of, of, of Britain's strategy in Ireland. And that then made people think a bit more about it. But having said all of that, as time went on, um, and there was all every to the physics of Cardinal, I think, and various other people trying to try and end it. It didn't. There was nothing there. And we just couldn't sit in that situation any longer. There was people who had already gone mad, like Alec Comerford, um, or the rest of them, who's, who's dead since. There's a lot of people left the protest, just couldn't, couldn't take, any, take any more of it. 
Um, so it wasn't an option just to sit this one people in just as we are. It wasn't going to happen. We needed if you're trying to bring about change or, or, or bring about a particular objective, then you have you've got to be you can't be just sitting passive. You're sitting passive that supports the status quo. So there had to be something. And pressure on the movement on the side, which has to be numbered from families. We ended up having the first summer strike at the end. We think that there's some solution. We find out it's absolutely nothing. What they want is total capitulation. And I suppose for the Brits at the end, it's the first summer strike. Their advisor, or whoever else was sitting there, must have thought, well, we haven't been. Psychologically, you know, the play the last harvest that you've talked about. Um, they've been on the protest now for, what have been that stage, over four years. They've had their hunger strike, and we give them nothing, so I'll be them totally demoralised. And that wasn't good at all. It was one of, yes, there's demoralisation, there's some people have been on the hunger strike, what had happened, particularly Sean McKenna, Sarah's Hill in the hospital. But a real anger at how we've been dealt with, and a determination that it, that it, it wasn't going to stay that way. And I think part of what Bobby had to do at that actual stage was stop people going on the way and do it, and open the prosecutions and all the rest. But the demand that was there to just go back on Humber Street was, was immense. Uh, it was probably the last thing the movement outside was that they've just had a lengthy Humber Street, in terms of resources, people, all the rest of it, exhaustion on the outside, and now here's this British government got another one. And I think it's a lot of pressure on Bobby to try to negotiate something. And I guess that film shows up. Um, there's no negotiation, because negotiation only happens if two sides are prepared and willing to sit down. And this is why sometimes you ask, or not sometimes, <coughs> frequently asked, was it worth it? And you say, that's okay, we've got a range of choices. And you say, you know, any, many, many more, he will go first with your home history. You didn't have a choice. It was sheer capitulation and surrender on home history. And there was no way we were going to just capitulate after that length of time. And what had happened. So you're in the second hunger strike, and it's worked out more technically in terms of, of, of how it unfolded and all the rest of it. Um, and I suppose I wasn't going to touch on it, but since, since, since Tommy has these mentions about this, I think that I don't really know Richard won't come in on it, I know what Richard's claim was about the, the second one, which uh, I totally disagree with. I don't, I don't believe that. I accept that he has a, has a few of it. My experience in the second hunger strike was that it was just on it about a week, I think it was before. Um, the Irish Commission for Justice of Peace came after four prisoners had already died. <coughs> and we sat for two days in the hospital. I was, I was in the wing. I was in the wing with Richard and, and Beck and, and, and others. And I was taken up to the hospital along with Mickey Devine for the, for the meetings because all, the other hunger strikers were already there. And uh, the Irish Commission for Justice of Peace spent two days really trying to top us off on the street. And that was all top of it. Here's what's on offer. And for me, there's always an offer. What was missing was a deal. An offer is, if you come off it, you get your own clothes. Okay. Uh, work will, you know, look at that there uh, and such like. Physics, well, you come off the protest and you get physics and you get ac access to education and all the rest of it. But we keep pushing and say, well, well what's, show, us, show us this here. Who's going to stand with us? What's civil service there? The second is Dave, <coughs> Jerry Adams, Danny Morris, and his guarantors. If it's but even teasing out, and their whole mind all the time was with the substance of the five demands. And we tried to explore the substance. It, it wasn't, just wasn't coming there at all. That went on all day Saturday. People like Kieran Duffery had to be taken back to the cell, just two, two weeks. Joe Big Gunn, <coughs> never read it, was just a wee, I suppose, anecdote on it. Um, I knew everybody who was else, else in the room, I knew all the homeless strikers anyway, some bad out of the doors. The only one missing was Joe Big Gunn. And only I knew Joe was missing, I wouldn't recognise the person who was wheeled in this. Wheelchair. Um, his head was just over to the side, his, his lips were all hacked, saliva coming out. <coughs> and it was an important lesson to me for uh, uh, later years because we looked at Joe and thought that's someone who is, is, is mentally ill or mentally ill, or physically, uh, I don't want to the proper term, handicapped, disabled. Uh, and yet when he spoke, he knew it was Joe McGuinness, I remember Joe from, from Ramond, and, and, and each five, he was a strong, spirited, you know. Belfast guy, and um, it was an important lesson, but it was also a show to the extent to which, which we got it. We were through a whole period that day where we've been promised things. We were sitting at a time where um, there's already been a lengthy hunger strike. There's been a protest now for four and a half years, and we've been told there's an offer up here somewhere. And this is no way. I don't, I don't think like we said there's no way, there's just no way, way we were ending that on the basis of an offer. The first hunger strikers had done it, which is no disparaging. They had ended it when they believed there was an offer. But I were told, yes, there's still an offer, and we're saying, shows it. Oh, you want it now, you want it to be the case for us, and now you've got it. 
Danny Morrison was my next morning, um, and one of the screws said bastard, and he thought it was him. He was referring to it, he was banned from the jail, and he actually meant Thatcher, because he thought Thatcher depicted it. Danny Morrison was going to let him see the What he told us was there was meetings going on on the outside, uh, directly between the Republican movement and the, and, and the Brits, that the uh, area special justice and peace was muddy in the waters, this was Dublin government uh, initiative in the Catholic Church. And uh, there's a thing, the Irish Christian Justice Police come back and again, again, it's all, it's all written about all of this in, in various books. And again, try to, to, to say the same thing. And at one point, and it was interesting to see how the dynamics had changed. On the first day, Oliver Crowley, who was a priest, was the one who was taking the lead. Now he was totally quiet, it was special with Martin who was, who was the lead. The Q Low, who was a SDLP politician. And at, at one point, Tom McElvey, who was a cousin of Oliver Crowley's, Turn around and says that what you're saying is we'll have our clothes and nothing else. And all our clothes are sitting directly across the stitches. And I was facing Pugel, who, and I remember this moment, because of his choice of words. He literally jumped up, he says it would be criminally irresponsible to say that. And nobody sought to use the word criminal about one of his own delegates, uh, which was Oliver Kelly. That was the end of the meeting. Just, it's over, because that's what we're told. You get your clothes, and that's the example that you're good enough for us. It was what we accepted at the end of the industry, but it wasn't good enough at that, at that, that point. But just the point of going on one bit over time, because I want to say it before, Richard can do that also, we, we can debate it. I do even tell me that Britain will act in Britain's interests. won't be humanitarian interests, won't be anything to do with Ireland or else. If it happens to coincide with Republican movement or whatever else, then fair enough, but that's only by people actually. At that time, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but we'll talk about Britain was under a certain amount of pressure worldwide in terms of support for the for the hunger strike and all the rest of it. That just coming but I not mention all the rest of it. Crime is a crime is a crime and all the rest of it. Thatcher and the Tory government could never act out of any humanitarian interest, but act in Britain's interest. So it would have to be that their intelligence chiefs, diplomats and all the rest of sit down and say, look, we're creating a bad situation here. The IRA is getting support now from companies that they've never got before. They're going to get money, they're going to get weapons, and we've got, we've got to end this. I don't care how we end it, let's give them the least possible to, to get us out of the situation, but we need to get out of it. That would be the only reason why the British government would decide to act and move from a position of a crime as a crime as a crime, and, and so on and so forth. And then when asked me, but they came to IRA and said, well, this is, this is what's on offer. And the IRA say, well, that's not good enough. And the Brits walk off the tail between their legs. I don't think so. The Brits would say, well, that's what's on offer. They came to us and said, here's what's on offer. You get your own clothes, we'll change work a bit, blah, blah, blah. They were running the media at even six o'clock. They had the Dublin government behind them, they had the Catholic Church, they had the SDLP, and said, because of reconsideration, because of demands, humanitarian pleas that have been made by the church, they have cloaked it in their language. We are instigating these new reforms. For all prisoners, as long as we look politics, we still think these people are terrorists, but we're, we're acting in a humanitarian basis to, to resolve the situation. And we quite better day would have been fucked. That would have been it. We could have stomped a bit and said, no, we want a bit more and all the rest to it. But if Joe McDonald had died a couple of days later, the blame would have been on us for, for, for not ending it. And that, for me, is the same reason that there was never, ever a deal offered to us. There was always an offer come off it. And we have always said that would have happened once in 1980. Mm -hmm. Shall we go back to the question? Thank you.